Greetings to you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this is Mazma Kenneth once again, and I want to appreciate the good Lord for the wonderful opportunity that has been given unto us to continue to be co-workers with him as far as the furtherance of the gospel is concerned. However, I also want to appreciate each and every one of you that are faithful Berenians for the time that you've taken to cross-examine a number of different things that are being shared in a number of different forums and uh, platforms. Well, today we are considering a very crucial subject and that is to do with the depth of the riches, wisdom and the knowledge of God. Now, the purpose of doing this teaching is to bring to your attention a number of crucial subjects and a number of outstanding verses in the scriptures that seem to be contradicting, yet those verses are indeed undeniable truths, but yet still unresolvable to man. I want to use a scripture that is to do with the second Timothy to begin with and uh, it will help us to actually have a foundation. It says, And that from a child you have known the holy scripture, scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now when Paul was writing to the junior minister that is known as Timothy, he makes it so very much clear to us that Timothy was exposed unto the Holy Scriptures as early as possible. And in the Holy Scriptures, Timothy was to be made wise. Now that is to mean not only to Timothy, but that is to mean that whoever is open to the reading of the Holy Scriptures, the Scriptures themselves are able to make that person wise the same way those scriptures made Timothy to be wise and through the reading of the scriptures one is able to have the wisdom that brings him to a place of knowing that he needeth to have salvation and that salvation is only a possibility through faith in the person of Christ. And that is to mean no any person today that will ever claim to say that salvation is in another person's name other than the name of Christ, that will ever make it so clear to us by saying that he has read the Bible. When you read the Bible, the Bible will bring you to a place of realizing that salvation is what all men need, and that salvation, much as all men need it, it is only a possibility in the person of Jesus Christ alone. In verse 16, all scripture. Now the word all in Greek simply means all. As in to say all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now that is to mean that Old and New Testament. Old Testament is part of the canon as well as the New Testament is part of the canon of the scripture. That is to mean that the same source of inspiration in the Old Testament is the same source of inspiration in the New Testament. The Greek word for inspiration is the word that is known as theonustas, which basically means that every content of the scripture was inspired by God. That is to mean that when you read scripture, it is God speaking. So the best way to know when God speaks, the best way for you to know the voice of God is to go to the scriptures. Now, I chose to use this scripture for the purpose of wanting to show you that there are a number of scriptures that might seem to be very contradicting to us and then in one or the other we might basically say could be this portion of the scripture is not part of the inspired canon of the scripture. Most people when they look at the life of Job and what he went through, attempts Simply because people do not understand what all of that was all about, they tend to think that what was God's aim in allowing this guy to go through what he went through. In fact, it was also strange to the friends of Job that they also 
began to accuse him of a number of different things. So, my dear ones, all I want to do as far as this teaching is concerned is to show you that yes, there are particular verses of scriptures, there are portions of scriptures that cannot be reconciled by any of us. There is an English word that we call antinomy. Antinomy is you being presented with two biblical truths from the scripture yet not being able to reconcile them together. I am saying it again. Antinomy is you being presented with two biblical truths from the scripture yet not being able to reconcile them together. And many of those scriptures that are in form of antinomy, that are under what we call the antinomy, is what I want to show you. Scriptures that are irreconcilable by any of us. That when we read them, when our eyes actually land onto them, we wonder and say, what do these verses really mean? So we are left speechless simply because those particular portions of the scriptures they have a foundation which foundation as far as to the intellect of man those particular scriptures cannot be fully in one way or the other reconciled so i want to show you and this is why we are actually talking about the depth of the riches wisdom and the knowledge of god my dear ones I want you to know something that is very important here that will help us to put everything in its rightful context. The book of Romans in chapter 11, Paul when he was talking about the salvation of the Jews that would later on come or what we might call the restoration of the Israelis with everything that pertains to their past, that pertains to the present and all of that that pertains to their future. It is something that is incomprehensible. But now, much as all of those particular things, they are indeed incomprehensible to us, the Bible says in Romans 11:33, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, and how his paths are beyond tracing out. So these are all important things for us to do what? To pay close attention to. So after defining the main subject as to why I want us to look into this, that is known as a, 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 the word that is known as antinomy, I want also to lay a foundation as far as this teaching is concerned by showing you something that is to do with other two important words for us to consider even as we are looking at this. The word is to do with what is known as providence. Providence simply means the ordering, the ordering of all things and events for God's own glory. That is to mean that when we talk about God's providence, we mean God being the one that ordereth all things and events for his own glory. The third word that is also very important for us to consider is the word that is known as the eternal decrees. The word that is known as or the doctrine of eternal decrees simply means what God has decided as far as the falling out of all things what God has decided as far as the falling out of all things. So in other words, the eternal decrees of God are things that God ordained before anything ever came into existence. That is to mean that the decrees of God are the eyes. However, when we talk about the providence of God, the providence of God are actually the hands that keep the will on course. So, the unfolding of all things, the unfolding of all things 
and the way they are ordered is one thing we can put under the providence. But those things that are being unfolded, they were determined a long time ago in eternity, in the certainty of God. He allowed and permitted particular things to be the way they are to happen. But as they continue to unfold, that is what we call the providence. If I may give you a very quick example to that. Just imagine you are a parent who says you want your child to go to school. You say, my child will go to school. Let us call that one to be what you have decided. But then, much as that is what you've decided, therefore you begin to put particular considerations, things that will lead to that. You need to be having a job need to be able to earn a living and that earning will also mean that you need to make some savings that will actually support what you decided so the decision and what brings that decision to pass so those are the two things that we need to do what to clearly understand so before god there is nothing that happens accidentally since he ordereth all things for his own glory. Now, the challenge is here with many of us today. For us, things that do happen to us, you say it was by chance. You say I was simply lucky. The language of lucky and the language of, of chance is not with God. There is nothing accidental about him. Is self-existing God, is all-sufficient God, is all-knowing God, He's omniscient, uh, He is actually all-powerful. So there is nothing that happens as far as the human affairs before God as an accident to Him. When Adam and Eve fell into the sin of actually them eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil with us, because we know what has happened when we, we see it happen. But before something happens before God, since He's all-knowing, He has seen things. He declares the end of all things before they do happen. Isaiah 46, 10, 11, 10 to 11 declares that. So, one thing that we need to construct here, the Bible gives us a clarity that before you ever see what happens in Genesis chapter 3, Revelation 13, 8 says that Christ is the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the earth. Imagine before the earth was, Christ was the Lamb of God that was slain. That is to mean there was nothing accidental about the sin of Adam. But that is something that is irreconcilable in your mind. And the moment you try to figure it out, you begin to say, why didn't God stop this? You begin to say, I think God never saw that one coming to pass and all of that. So you, you fidget with it in your hands. And that is why so many uh, Bible teachers have gone ahead to say that uh, God's hands were actually tied up. He didn't know what was happening because he had given all his power to men. Many of the word of faith preachers teach that, that God's hands were now tied. He didn't know what to do because all the authority, dominion he had given to men. So he could not intervene in the issues of men. He could not actually uh, do something because w when you talk about the dominion, he had given it to Adam and all of that particular thing. But because we lack the depth, because the Bible speaketh of the depth of the riches of the wisdom and of the knowledge of God that are unsearchable, His ways that are beyond tracing out, is why we fidget with things and we see them from our, in our peanut brains and we're like, what is this? But before God, everything was already sorted out. His ways are beyond tracing out. So there was nothing like any fidgeting on the side of God. But with us who read and are not part of him that was from everlasting, things are beyond our understanding. Remember, my dear ones, one thing that is very outstanding, the fact that the wisdom and the knowledge of God is unsearchable 
it is why God he is who he is. He is all knowing, all powerful, is the God that is always there. His ways and thoughts are way too beyond our imagination and thoughts. No man can comprehend the riches and wisdom and the knowledge of God. That is why Paul the Apostle, writing by the Spirit in Romans 11, 33, he says how unsearchable are his judgments and how, and how untraceable are his ways. This is to mean that as much as we are indwelt with the Spirit of God, Romans 8, 9, there are particular things that we shall never know because they are beyond our understanding. Remember Deuteronomy 29, 29 actually makes it very clear. The things that are revealed are those made known to men so we might keep the word of the Lord. And those that are hidden, they are not for us to know. Yes, we have the mind of Christ. But that mind of Christ that is given unto us is to enable us to know his word and to know what he did for us. First Corinthians chapter 2 verse 16. That much as we are indwelt with the third person of the Godhead, but even the intercession that he maketh on our behalf with groanings, the Bible says they are too deep for us to be said in words. All the sound Bible teachers of our time, they have clearly made an emphasis by saying that when you have a shallow knowledge of God, you end up with a shallow worship and praise unto God. Vice versa. You know why? Because the moment you understand the intrinsic glory of God, that which pertains to the totality of all that God is, that God depends on us for nothing because he's self-sufficient, that we can add nothing to him as the self-existing God, the one that is from everlasting. Knowing God for all that he is results in us ascribing glory unto him in honor, in worship and praise. Because everything about him is holiness. His love is holiness. His mercy is holiness. His grace is holiness. His truthfulness is holiness. His goodness is holiness. His foreknowledge is holiness. His wrath is holiness. His wisdom is holiness. His righteousness is holiness. His omnipresence is holiness. His omniscience is holiness. His omnipotence is holiness. He is morally perfect in all things. Now, the examples of things that I want to show you that will make you think so much and why I have called them the antinomies, you being presented with two biblical truths from the scripture, yet being unable to reconcile them together. Take an example of Genesis 45, Genesis 45, and the verse is, uh, if we may consider verse 3. Bible says, and Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Verses 4. Then Joseph said unto his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. Verses 5. And now do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourselves. For selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Now you see one thing here that is indeed an antinomy. Joseph attributes all of that which happened to him to God's providence. Joseph, his brothers, not having been compelled by God as free agents, he permitted their evil actions. But at the end of it all, God worked it out for his own glory to preserve the lives of the Israelis. Now, my dear ones, this in our understanding is indeed very hard to be reconciled. The common question is, what? The man says that now do not be distressed. Don't be angry with your souls. 
for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me here ahead of you. It is an antinomy. It is so difficult for you and I to understand it without the background of us knowing Romans chapter 11 verses 33 that talks about the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God and his judgment that are unsearchable and his ways that are beyond tracing out. It is an antinomy. How can you tell me that much as God is not the one that compelled the brothers of Joseph to sell them, but at the end of it all, whatever they meant for wrong, the Lord turned it out to be something that would result in people's lives being saved and the God gaining glory that is sovereign over all human affairs. Chapter 50 of Genesis, verses 20, it says this, beginning with verses 19, But Joseph said unto them, Do not be afraid, I am in the place of God. Verses 20, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for God to accomplish what is now being done, saving many lives. That verse alone is another antinomy. These are the antinomies, the truth in the scriptures that cannot be reconciled in our wisdom. But remember the things we started with. One thing that is known as the eternal decrees of God, the way God decided that things should fall out. But one thing that is very important is that the players in the context here of Joseph's brothers, God was not behind their evil action. But the Bible says what they intended as far as harming Joseph, God intended it for God to accomplish what is now being done. It is an antinomy. It is very difficult to reconcile. Those are things we shall never understand this side of eternity. One thing we need to understand is that the actions of Joseph's brothers were indeed inexcusable. But God shows us how he's sovereign over all human affairs. I want to give you another illustration. Looking at the book of John, chapter 19. John chapter 19, beginning with verses 10. It says, Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize that I have power either to free you or to crucify you? He was speaking to the Lord Jesus. Verses 11. And Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of the greater sin. Now look at that particular scripture. That it shows that the Lord answers by saying, You have no power over me apart from that which is given to you from above. Now my dear ones, that is what we call providence. God is providence. God ordering all the events of our lives. That Pilate was in a position he was in because God permitted him to be in that place of authority. That no authority Pilate had that God never gave to him to be a leader in Judea. And this is to mean wherever you are in life, it is God that has permitted people to be born where they are born. If you talk about a particular level of success that has been given to an individual, I want you always to know that the source of all authority is none other than the Creator. We should not pride ourselves to think that we are in charge. The ultimate authority is God himself. He is sovereign over all things. He is the life giver. He keepeth the one he wants. He takes the one he pleases. So today we are living in an era where people are priding in their skills, in their talents, in their, in, in, in their wisdom. And there are people 
seeking for this, seeking for that. Some are seeking for children. Some are seeking for marriage. Some are seeking for success. Some are battling poverty with health, with sickness, and a number of different things that you can talk about in life. But be that as it may, I want you to understand one simple thing. That the Lord is sovereign over all things. The things that we have discussed that are to do with the doctrine of eternal decrees, the doctrine of God's providence, those are all things that should make us to be very much humbled before God. No one of us will go past what God ordained for us to go. The Bible makes it very clear in the book of Psalms 90 that even our days on earth are numbered. They are all numbered. You cannot exceed or go past the line that God actually put as far as your life is concerned. If there are particular skills that you have, it is God who has given you. If there's a particular talent, that is why all the praise and the glory should go back unto God. If it is rain, it will shower the land of those that are God-fearing and the land of those that are not God-fearing. If it is the sunshine, it will actually shine over the land of those that are God-fearing and those that are not God-fearing. So, no any man should begin to glorify or to boast about himself. Every person on earth should boast in the Lord because he is the only one that is most sovereign. The leaders of the nations, where you and I might be, they are not the most sovereigns. They do not order how things happen in their countries, how things happen in the world. If it is a tsunami, if it is some kind of a very good weather, bad weather, God is sovereign over human affairs. Very important things for us to do what to understand. Pilate, the Lord Jesus told him, you have no authority other than that which was given unto you. You have no. So the providence of God was remarkable in ordering the affairs of man. Very important thing for us to do what? To really do what? To understand. So even the ones that the Lord Jesus stood before, they never had actually the final word. So None of us should be proud about a particular office we are in and then we look down onto others because you're born into a particular family that is very wealthy, because you have particular looks, you have a particular stature, you have a particular strength. All the honor and the glory goes back to God because he is the source of all authority. And people who do forget that they are individuals that Instead of them worshipping their creator, they begin to worship themselves. More evidence, Romans 1 verses 20 to 31 clarifies how people begin to actually in one or the other to look down onto everything that screams before them that there is a creator. My dear ones, the Bible shows something that is very important also from the book of Acts here that I want to connect to that, to that particular scripture. Acts chapter 2, 23. It says, let us begin in verse 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. Verse 23. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan. If God had not allowed so, it was not going to do what? to come to pass. But the Bible says, and for our knowledge, and with the help of the wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. This is the evidence of it all my dear ones who are listening to this one here. That God brings to pass the good out of that that evil men actually were plotting. Pilate himself like we saw was a free agent and one thing that we realize that he acted out of his nature without any compulsion yet the purpose of god that was long before predicted was fulfilled 
and Jesus made an atonement for the sins of the world. That is to mean God overrules the wickedness of men. That even in a situation where men are like, you know what, we want our way to be the one to be fulfilled, still God has a way of getting beauty out of that which is evil, getting freedom out of that that seemed to be actually of slavery. Those are the antinomies, the truth that seem to be contradicting, but it's indeed undeniable, however it is unresolvable to us as men. There's another thing that is very important for us to understand, and it's one of the scriptures that also needs us to pay attention to. When you consider the book of Luke, chapter 22, Luke 22, verses 21, it says, But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with me on the table. The Son of Man will go, as it has been decreed, woe unto that man who betrays him. Now, to put a balance to this, the scripture here in NIV, it says that as it has been decreed, things that were decreed, they are indeed an antinomy to us. They are irreconcilable to us. Because we are talking about the certainty of God. We are talking about what God planned throughout eternity. What would happen? And with our peanut brains, we cannot reconcile these things. Which is to mean that Judas Iscariot was never in one or the other compelled by God to do what he did. But his nature, what was in his heart, was to be revealed by what he did here in this particular context. He was never contented. He loved money beyond any other thing. And that is where the justice of God comes in. That is where God permits some things to be done. Because what a person has done indeed shows you that God judges all men in justice. Judas was one of the disciples of Christ. And the Lord provided for all of them. But he was never contented. He always sought for more and more and more. Criticizing even those that wanted to, that were always wanting to be a blessing to the Lord. Like a woman who came with a, with a boat of the arabasta oil. And he began to say, I wish this was sold and the money gotten out of it would have been given to the poor ones. He was never contented. And in that, he fell into the gap of the Pharisees because first of all, they were enemies to Christ. And everything that was pertaining to his teaching. And because his heart was not in contentment, his heart was not satisfied with what was at hand, automatically the eternal decree of the Lord, how God determined things to fall out, Jesus was to go to the cross, but there are particular free agents that played within there because of their, the evilness of people's hearts. Do you remember this is what Jeremiah tells us in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, verses 9. It says something very important. It says that the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure who can understand it. God alone can understand the heart of a man. So, you and I would never have come to a place of knowing who Judas was. Even the apostles themselves, the rest of the disciples, they themselves, all of them, they forsook the Lord and whatever they did, apart from the issue of betraying him in the sense of uh, giving him into the hands of, of the other by actually them being given money. But all of them, you do not have known who Peter is. If that scenario of the young girl had not come in for him to say that he never knew the Lord. You would not have known the adultery that was in the heart of David. If that issue of actually David and Bathsheba wasn't shown to us in the scripture. Uh, you would not have known that uh, uh, Joseph and everything that pertained to his heart. If he didn't go through what he did what he went through. The same for a man that is known as Job. Job indeed loved the Lord independent of something physical that he had received, independent of the blessing. That is one thing that the devil wanted to check out. But it all actually played out the way God knew it was. That Job indeed loved God independent of things that God had blessed him with. Very important things for us to consider. And when you look into the book of Acts, 
still in chapter 4 and verses are 25 Peter the apostle repeats the same thing he says in verse 25 and when they heard this they raised their voices together in prayer to God sovereign Lord they said you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them you spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant our father David why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain. That is Psalms chapter 2 that, uh, that uh, actually Peter was quoting. Verse 26. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers burn together against the Lord and against the, the anointed one. The way we see it in the Gospels. 27. Indeed Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed. Verses 28. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. So everything that is to do with this as you see verses 28 it's another antinomy irreconcilable before us it's non-contradicting but in our own understanding it would appear to be contradicting but god who is indeed rich in wisdom in knowledge whose judgments are unsearchable and beyond tracing, decided and ordered the events of all things for his own glory. That's the Bible. I want to show you something. Romans also gives us another antinomy. In Romans chapter 9 verses 9, it says, For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time I'll return, I'll return and Sarah will have a son. You imagine. Abraham at a hundred years, Sarah at ninety years. But God had the right time when he was to bless them with that son. And everything was ordained in eternity. How it had to be played out, how it had to fall out. Now where are you and I stagger? simply because we don't have the details of how things are going to fall out that is why we need to trust in him we need to have faith in the revealed truth that we do have in the written word of god the fact that you don't know how your tomorrow is going to be that is why psalms 118 24 says that this is the day the lord has made we shall rejoice in it and be glad in it that why should you rejoice and be glad in a day that you have actually had some challenging thing. It is because the make of the day tells you to smile. To be glad is on top of every challenge you, 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 you can ever encounter in a day. So you may not know how all things are going to, to play out. But your trust and confidence in him is one thing that shows that you know what he's doing. And even if you have no confidence in what he's doing, for him he knows what he's doing. However, it is you that is going to be actually under pressure. That is why he said, do not allow your heart to be troubled. Because he knows our hearts are prone to be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. So ours, the, the work, the burden is on to us believing what he says that we should do. If he said, don't allow your heart to be troubled, do that. It's not easy, but as you depend on him, you rely on him by the power of his spirit. He's able to keep you not to be troubled. He told Paul that he was to reach Rome safely together with the people that were on board with him. But what he didn't tell Paul that they were to encounter actually fierce storms and winds. What was left of Paul was to believe and to trust that the one who had told him that him and the people on board would reach the other side safely. That was the only thing that was left in the hand of Paul, actually to believe that God told me we shall reach safely. He told David the throne was his, but for 14 years Saul persecuted him. 14 years, what was left of David? To trust in God's promise. There are things that you and I cannot reconcile. But we need to be very sure that God knows what he's doing. He is omniscient. He's all-powerful. He's the Lord that is always there. Important verses are 
10, Romans 9:10. Not only that, but Rebecca's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Look at verses 11. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, look at verses uh, 12, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. Verses 13. Just as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Verses 14. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. 15. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. 16. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God is he mercy. I may not go beyond this, but one thing I want to show you, my dear ones. Before Jacob and Esau ever did anything, the one that ordained, the one that ordereth all things for his own glory, he chose Jacob. You ask me, Kenneth, why? I don't know. The Bible says that God is not unjust. Whatever situation you find yourself in, family born in, and everything that pertains to human affairs, you should know that there is one that is sovereign over all issues. You may not be understanding why you're born where you're born. You may not be understanding why you're not like the other person or the other person. That is not for you to figure out. The main thing is you trusting in him. The Bible says he's the author and the perfecter of our faith. Our eyes should be on him because there are things you and I can never reconcile. They are non-contradicting. But remember the foundation of it is that the Bible talks about the depth of the riches, of the wisdom, of the knowledge, and how the judgments of the Lord are unsearchable, and how his ways are beyond tracing. Jacob, not having done anything, God chose him. Why am I black? Why are the other people white? Why are those ones Asians? Why is the other one short? Why is the other one tall? Why is the other one brown? Why is the other one strong? The other one is weak-bodied. And all of those particular things, you and I are not able to reconcile that. But be that as it may, all the honor and the glory belongs our God. All the honor and glory belongs to our God. Bible says in the book of Psalms 75, Psalm 75, verses 5, Don't lift up your horns, again a seven. Do not speak so defiantly. No one from east or from the west or from the desert can exalt themselves. It is God who judges. He brings one down, he exalts another. And whether you believe or you're not a believer, this is the truth of it all. There is one that overrules all the affairs of men. And our trust is in him that knoweth all things, that is sovereign over all things, that reigns over all things. The Bible says something in the book of Daniel chapter 4 that is also something that you and I can never reconcile. Verses uh, 34. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven and said, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is, is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. 35. All the people of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He pleases with the powers of of heaven and the peoples of the earth no one can hold back his hand or say unto him what have you done when you study from the book of uh, isaiah there is something that is also very important that i need also to read out for you to to get in isaiah 10 this is another antinomy verses 5 isaiah 10 5 to 7 it says woe unto the assyrian 
the rod of my anger, in whose hand is the club of, of my wrath. Verse 6. I send him against a godless nation. I dispatch him against a people who anger me to seize lot and snatch plunder and to trample them down like mud in the streets. Verses 7. But this is not what he intends. This is not what he has in his mind. His purpose is to destroy, to put to an end to many nations. And not my commanders, all kings, he says. So, but when you look in chapter 14, the end of the Assyrian is also shown to us. In 14.24 it says, The Lord Almighty has sworn, Surely as I have, I have planned, so it will be. As I have purposed, so it will happen. Verses 25, I will crush the Assyrian in my land. On my mountains, I will trample him down, and his yoke will be taken from my people, and his burden removed from their shoulder. So even in those, look at verses 26, and uh, this is the plan determined for the whole world, and this is the hand stretched out over all nations. 27, the Lord Almighty has purpose who can fight him. In other words, stop him. His hand is stretched out, and who can turn it back? That's the truth of the matter. The number of things that you and I have no knowledge about, and they are non-contradicting, but these are things that we shall never know why they played out the way they played out. But remember, we talked about the providence, God ordering all things for his own glory. Ephesians 1, 11, it says, In whom we were chosen, having been predestined, according to the plan of him who worketh out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. My dear ones, Ephesians 1.11 says, In him we also were made God's heritage portion. We obtained an, in an inheritance, for we had been foreordained, chosen, and appointed beforehand in accordance with his purpose, who works out everything in agreement with a counsel and a design of his own will. So, if the Bible talks about God working out all things in the counsel of his own will, therefore we shall never get to know the counsel of his own will. There are a number of different verses that we can also consider that actually talk about a number of important things. But for the sake of time, I do not want to go beyond this point, only to let you know that, my dear one, the Lord is sovereign over all things. We should trust in His sovereignty. And many people today, they are struggling with the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. And uh, they keep on thinking that maybe it's their scholarly thing, it's their families, it is this and all of that that will make things happen for them. And that is why it's important. Do not, they do not believe that even there are people in the scripture that we see that God himself made sick for his own glory. Moses himself, and then you look at the man in the book of John chapter 9, that the Lord himself answered to the disciples, saying that none of his family members uh, sinned, and he, he himself he never did anything, anything sinful. But for the glory of the Lord to be manifested in him. When it came to Paul the apostle, he left him with a body weakness, and therefore he used Paul tremendously in his weakness to show his glory. There are several things that we will never reconcile. But God knows what he's doing. So we should actually continue to trust in him to know that he is on top and he's sovereign over all things and is in charge over everything that we may even seem not to do or to understand. All national leaders should actually submit themselves to him. I hear clan leaders and every, every sort of leadership, we are all to submit and to the Lordship of Christ, because He is the Lord, He is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Nothing that happens in human affairs that actually is not under the hand of God. We should trust in Him for everything and know that the one who created this, this universe is the one who rules this universe. You are blessed with blessings and shalom.